Good morning. I know that the uh, the picture they put on the front of this video was going to look very attractive. Um, I uh, had to get up and turn on the light. Uh, it's a very dark, rainy morning. Uh, April 29th, Wednesday. And, uh, you know, May is almost here. Um, winter is coming, said Game of Thrones. Uh, but anyway, um, this morning, uh, of course, when I went on Canvas and put your assignments up there, um, we really didn't go over this unit, if you recall, uh, during uh, the school year. This is the one that you took home and you took the uh, collaborative test on. But we didn't go over it in class. Um, you say, well, why didn't we? Why didn't we didn't. I didn't think we had time back then. And um, a lot of the things in it are simply rote memorization, and which might seem very, very random to a lot of people. Very, very, you know. But as we approach this one all-important dbq i can't get past the idea that this dbq will be something that covers a span you know i just don't think that they would uh the writers would say okay let's just talk about this one specific person or this one specific instance uh, but the, and so having said that you know, it's very important that we trace things like not only women's history, uh, but also the history of culture, the history of thinking, uh, intellectual movements, and be able to understand them, be able to talk about them, and hence this unit. Um, and so with that, uh, let's go through this and you know remember you know hats up hats off to my science geeks in here um, and I call you geeks in the most affectionate way um, uh, like I've told you many times I'm a nerd and I like nerds uh, but if you're a, a science geek and um, there's an intellectual question about age of science or age of reason you know you knowing a little bit of the history of where so much of the information you study about comes from could be could be with uh, worth a couple of easy points and so yeah let us begin pull that up uh yeah let's talk about deism Once again, the Enlightenment thinkers that we're going to talk about later on, the Enlightenment thinkers <clears throat> wanted to apply science and logic and equations to every facet of human existence, every facet of existence. And uh, one of the places where they, they made a big mistake, although there are actually people who are still deist per se, so I really shouldn't say it's a mistake, but it's a mistake. Um, was in formulating this thing called uh, the clockmaker theory of the universe. Um, so what was the clockmaker theory of the universe? Well, it goes back to the fact that, remember that the intelligentsia, the philosophs, the smart guys of this time period uh, were against accepting simply anything that they had been taught uh, <clears throat> on its face value. Uh, if somebody tells you something, you should reason it out. You should doubt everything, and that's fine. Uh, that's great. But once again, they're trying to, uh, to apply science and logic to something that is entirely human, and that is faith. You know what a person believes 
And so the thinkers basically looked like this. Well, you know, this universe with all the planets revolving around each other, uh, with all the uh, nature occurring, you know, lion eats the antelope, the lion dies, it becomes the grass, the animal beats the grass, and the four seasons come, and everything seems to work in perfect harmony, that such a miraculous machine could not have been an accident. It had to have a planner. And so um, that's where this theory of the clockmaker theory of the universe comes from, that um, they reject the traditional idea of a deity uh, in favor of this thing that they call the supreme being. And the supreme being uh, set up this universe that operates much like a clockmaker. If you've ever looked on the inside, and I haven't, not long, actually I had when I was a kid, uh, we still use the mechanical clocks with the springs and everything. Uh, you can't find them anymore. But uh, if you ever looked on the inside of such a clock, uh, a mechanical clock is full of cogs and, and springs and levers and uh, all sorts of things. And especially the big clocks they used had the pendulums. And the weights, especially the giant clocks that uh, oftentimes occupied the main squares of many European cities. Everything worked together intricately to produce the time or whatever. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to some of uh, the old towns in Europe, for example, Prague. They had a clock that not only told time, it also told the season. It also told the alignment of the planets at that particular time. Big tourist attraction. Unfortunately, when I was there, it was closed for repairs. But yeah, I mean, but it was a very complicated device. And so such a complicated device needed somebody to make it. Now, that's and that's part of the theory. The other part of the theory is that uh, this supreme being, after he had constructed this grand thing, um... He just walked away, left it alone. And, yeah, that is, in a sense, deism. It's the idea that uh, the universe was constructed by a supreme being and then psh, left alone. Now, the thing is, in such an arrangement, um, the supreme being that constructed all this, he set it up. And after that, so therefore things like prayer, things like doing uh, the seven sacraments, uh, worship, uh, obedience to a set of moral guidelines, no purpose in it, uh, which explains a lot of the behaviors of a lot of these philosoph guys. Uh, no purpose in doing any of all this. They, you know, there's a supreme being, and he created it. Um, and so uh, there is, you see more and more, a rejection of uh, conventional religion, uh, a rejection, uh, in fact, uh, one other thing about deism, I mean, there are a lot of deists that, once again, and we've talked about this before, very popular uh, in American history. Thomas Jefferson was a deist. Benjamin Franklin was a deist. Many of the founding fathers were deists. In fact, and I, we talked about this in class before, that Thomas Jefferson, a favorite target of mine, who history has somehow given a pass to for all of his sins. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was such an ardent deist that 
Uh, and, you know, Thomas Jefferson, very well read, obviously, had read the Bible from one end to the other. Well, in his Bible, everywhere Thomas Jefferson found a reference to something that was, was miraculous, that was not logical, that did not, you know, you wouldn't see every day, that could not be explained away. Thomas Jefferson would pull out his scissors and cut it up, you know, remove it. I really would like to have seen what Thomas Jefferson's Bible looked at when it looked like when it was finished. Benjamin Franklin was the same way. Benjamin Franklin organized something called the Hellfire Club. And the Hellfire Club was a group of these guys uh, who were deists. And there were a lot, there were, uh, a great number of Benjamin Franklin and his friends, the deists, on Sunday morning when most of the other colonists were attending church services. Benjamin Franklin and his compadre would uh, go to the local tavern, which they persuaded the owner to open early so they could go in there. And they would sit down every Sunday morning and consume alcohol and uh, talk about ideas. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah. Voltaire went even further. Voltaire hated organized religion and especially the Roman Catholic Church because he said that the Roman Catholic Church proffered inequality, that the Roman Catholic Church set certain people, the priest, above everybody else. And so his remark, crush the infamous thing, was a reference to organized religion and was a reference particularly to Roman Catholicism. He saw it as unjust. Yeah. The cult of the supreme being, we'll learn a, maybe a little bit about that when we talk about the French Revolution. Uh, during the French Revolution, which is why the Age of Reason ends with the French Revolution, um, the revolutionary government tried to organize a religion based on reason, and it was called the cult of the supreme being. Uh, Robespierre <coughs> portended that he was the high priest. Okay. Let's quickly go through these. Uh, we're on Roman numeral 11 now, if you have your study guide up. Who were these people and what were their contributions? Zacharias Jansen um, was the inventor of the microscope in which he simply took Galileo's telescope and added it, I mean, inverted a few of the lenses. Anton van Leeuwenhoek, a Dutch person, was the first person to see bacteria under the microscope. Evangelistica Torcelli, Italian, invented the barometer. The barometer is device all important in weather forecasting because it measures air pressure. Yeah. And changes in air pressure, differences in air pressure. If you understand difference in air pressure, you understand the weather. Uh, Gabriel Fahrenheit and under Celsius invented the temperature scales that you are familiar with now. Fahrenheit, of course, invented the scale that we use in this country, which for some reason sets free the te freezing temperature of water at sea level 32 degrees, boiling point of water at sea level 212 degrees. Whereas Celsius uh, invented a more practical um, temperature scale. Zero is that freezing point. 100 is that boiling point. But anyway. Uh, what did Galen assume about the circulation of the body? Remember, Galen is uh, a Greek thinker. Galen was the guy who believed that uh, the liver manufactures blood, the heart pumps blood, it goes out into the extremities where the body eats it. And I mean, you know, not that you're supposed to do autopsies, but people who had looked at people's organs, it made sense. Of course, they never understood that uh, we have in our body these little microscopic things called capillaries where oxygen is transported uh, to the various parts of the body 
and therefore it is, and then the, the used blood goes back to the heart and or carbon dioxide is, you know, you know this, you know this, but Galen didn't know that. And then that is why George Washington died the way he did. Yeah. You knew that about that, didn't you, Miss Sergeant? How uh, George Washington died? No? Well, George Washington, after he'd retired from the presidency and was putting his estate back together at Mount Vernon, uh, he had this, he liked to, and George Washington's another guy that history gives a pass to. Um, I mean, people honor and revere him today, and yeah, okay, he did some great things, but he also owned slaves, and you don't own slaves and get slaves to do what you want them to do by being a nice guy to the slaves. And George Washington, anyway, he, although George Washington put it in his will that his, his slaves would be freed upon his death. So I guess that was something. But anyway, um, George Washington had this habit of uh, every day he would get on his horse and he would ride the expanse of his farms to basically see, make sure everything was going all right. And one November morning, he got up and rode out, and there was like a mist in the air. By afternoon, that mist had turned into freezing rain. And so it was the worst combination. There's one thing to be cold, quite another to be wet and cold. And so when George Washington came back, he had ice encrusted in his hair. And he immediately caught what we would call a cold. And all you good grandmothers out there know that the best treatment is to get into bed, get warm, drink lots of fluids, you know, uh, try to clear the congestion, chicken soup. But no, George Washington did the worst thing that you could back then, uh, Miss Sergeant. He, uh, they called not one doctor, they called three. Three doctors. Because he, after all, he was the president. And, of course, they put their heads together and came up with, uh, let's see, one thing they did, they took a bunch of dried beetles, insects, wrapped them in a paper, made it into a poultice by grinding them up, and then wrapped it around his neck. <laughs> At least that didn't hurt him. Then the second thing they did was to induce diarrhea. Once again, this idea of Galen that, you know, uh, this medieval idea that when you're sick, toxins, impurities are in your body and you need to get rid of them. So diarrhea was a way. Of course, you and I know that diarrheics, aside from being just totally disgusting, is also dehydrating. He was losing fluids. Oh, yes. And then they decided to bleed the man. Not once, but twice. And uh, the second bleeding did him in. Yeah. And there it is. But see, yeah. All right. So, uh, Paracelsius changed his name from Philippus Ariolus von Hohenheim to Paracelsius, meaning he was greater than this guy. Than Andre Celsius. He felt that illnesses were caused by a chemical imbalance in certain organs that could be treated with the infusion of certain kinds of chemicals. Medicine. He was very argumentative and arrogant and was forced to spend much of his life wandering. Uh, he came up with the idea that like cures like, which is an interesting theory. Andreas Vesalius wrote The Structure of the Human Body. Uh, during that time, it was difficult to know what the body looked like because the Roman Catholic Church had this big thing about touching dead people. They were afraid that it would you'd be embracing a uh, pseudoscience called necromancy. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, while he disagreed with Galen about blood being produced in the liver and consumed the body, he did retain his own ideas. Uh, William Harvey is the guy. 
William Harvey was the first person to suggest that blood actually circulates through the body. Unfortunately, George Washington's doctors failed to get the memo. In fact, neither did Catherine the Great. You know that Catherine the Great, when she had her second, her big stroke, Catherine the Great of Russia was also bled. I know, go figure. <coughs> Edward Jenner, oh yes. Edward Jenner and the process of vaccination. Now, Edward Jenner was confronted with one of the biggest killers the world has ever seen, smallpox. Uh, and smallpox was a killer. But Edward Jenner um, noticed that in his town that everybody was susceptible to smallpox, except for the women who milked cows. They got a rather mild form of, it looked like smallpox, but it wasn't, called cowpox. And the cowpox, just like smallpox, the cowpox would make, it's called pox because a pox is like a sore on your skin. And the cowpox, uh, they would get cowpox and then they'd recover and they'd be fine. They were immune to the smallpox. And so he sort of theorized uh, that if I could get some of that cowpox, into uh, some of these uh, smallpox patients, and his first patient was a child, that perhaps we could cure or prevent this deadly disease. And that's exactly what he did. As grody as it sounds, uh, Mr. Kiwata, he uh, went to these women who had the smallpox lesions on their skin, and he took a blade and he scraped off the pus and then he used that blade and made a little cut in the child. And of course, to make sure, to make sure that the uh, small, what the cowpox stuff, we all know as antibodies, got into the uh, patient and therefore the patient became immune. By the way, Mr. Lynn, um, a lot of people are getting very excited right now because it seems that the good folks at Oxford University um, have a vaccine that they are very hopeful about. They say that it has turn, turned out very positive um, results with monkeys. They did an experiment up in North Dakota, I think. Uh, on uh, monkeys and had very positive effects. And now there are lots and lots of people who are lining up to volunteer to try the vaccine. Uh, you know, of course, they always tell us, don't get your hopes up, uh, you know. And even if all things go well, still won't be looking at, you know, a vaccine for the world until um, probably the end of this year. September in most of Europe, but you know, yeah, that would be nice. Um, you know, for me, of course, and I hope for most of you, this whole Corona thing has been something that you heard about in the news out there. Um, I actually, I actually know of one person. I know a person, friend of mine, not from the royal community, so don't even worry about that. Uh, who uh, contracted, was on a ventilator, and now he's home, but still. I mean, it's real stuff. And so, you know, I know it's wrecking the economy. Just, <laughs> you should look at my stock, you should look at my stock portfolio. I've been saving money for the last 40 years in stocks, and, you know, they're just getting pummeled. Uh, and you know what? That'll recover. Because, Mr. Combs, I'm not going anywhere. I don't have any intention of retiring too soon. Uh, you know, so after the, they beat this stuff down and, you know, the world starts recovering, that stock market will recover. Stock market is still 
including the Great Depression, the only investment that has consistently stayed ahead of inflation. Right now is a blip, just like what happened in 2007-2008 was a blip. Okay, uh, now let's get back to this. Chemistry, as we know, came from alchemy. Alchemy is the pseudoscience of turning base metals into gold. Come on, chemistry guys. Come on, science geeks. Who was the father of chemistry? His name, Antoine Lavoisier. Um, by the way, if you were ever wondering, if you're wondering, what are you looking at, Mr. Horton? I'm looking at this. And I will show you that. But notice that my phone uh, is as blank as yours. So in other words, you can learn these things. But anyway, that's me showing off. <laughs> Such a nerd. But anyway, um, his name was Antoine Lavoisier. And Antoine Lavoisier, Frenchman, um, is known as the father of chemistry. I believe he came up with a periodic table. You don't quote me on that. Or maybe he came up with the idea of, you know, Robert Boyle came up with oxygen, didn't he? Well, anyway, um, Antoine Lavoisier lived around the time of the French Revolution. And as so many people did during the French Revolution, he found himself on the wrong side of the argument. Um, meaning that, you know, in the reign of terror in the French Revolution, um, lots of people were getting very close haircuts. And so Antoine Lavage, being scientist to the very end, um, there was a debate going on at the time as to is this device, this new device, the guillotine, is this guillotine a humane form of punishment. I mean, when you cut somebody's head off, do they feel pain? And if so, how long do they feel pain? And there was a debate over that. I mean, most people, including Dr. Guillotine, not Dr. Guillotine, by the way, was not the inventor. Dr. Guillotine wrote a commentary in a magazine extolling the virtues of this device saying it was a humane way to execute somebody. Well, anyway, um, there was a debate over it. And so Antoine Lavage, like I said, found himself on the wrong side of the argument. He was sentenced to death for, in the reign of terror, you could be sentenced to death for complaining about the price of bread or by having doubts as to how the revolution was going. Anything. Well, anyway, so Antoine Lavage is going to be a scientist to the end. And he says, we will um, settle this argument once and for all. And he made an agreement with a friend of his that his friend was to stand in front of the guillotine with his hands out to catch the head of Antoine Lavage. Now, of course, Antoine Lavage could say, hey, I'm still thinking here. I mean, he could not say that. But the deal was they were going to uh, count the number of times Lavage blinked. And they did it. 14. 14 blinks. Now, what does that mean? Uh, you know, like I said, when... Uh, I was a kid. Mom used to make fried chicken on Sunday for Sunday dinner, and early that morning she would get up, snatch up a couple of uh, roosters, take them over to a stump, whack off their heads, toss it, you know, whack off one, toss them around, and I've seen those chickens. I saw it myself. I saw it myself. Take off running. That headless chicken took off running. Got about, I don't know, 10 yards for it. Um, so, I mean, 
What does that tell you? It tells you nothing. Uh, it also tells you you cannot conclude that because Antoine Lavage was blinking for 14 blinks that he was still Antoine Lavage when he was doing it. You don't know. But it's interesting. All right. Roman number 13. <clears throat> Let's talk about women. Here's a name I think you'll find familiar. Uh, and by the way, when I grade your DBQs, I'm learning about Canvas all the time. I thought I put comments there at the bottom of the thing. I don't know if you can read those or not. I'm going to put them on the side so you can make sure you see them when I say nasty things to you uh, about, about your paper. And I say that as kind of a halfway joke, but at the same time, you know, it's all constructive. I want us to do the best we can. But anyway. Let's talk about women, and yes, this name, Margaret Cavendish, will come up. According to recent discussions of modern European history, women had a role in early developments of science and research. Uh, of course, it has to be admitted, and you know, it does. I mean, as much, and, and that's really what bothers me about the study of history. You know, history should be accurate. And I'm all for the cause of promoting women's issues. But to be real honest, throughout the great majority of history, uh, women's contributions were minimal and even ignored. Is the sun shining outside, really? And even ignored for the most part. And even in academic circles, once again, uh, remember during the Enlightenment, most of the Enlightenment thinkers, they said, oh, how, you know, how do women measure up to men? And then they simply began to tailor their research to justify the idea that women and men were different and that women were inferior to men. Uh, so it, it was bad science. All right, so. The few women who did take advantage of the meager opportunities offered to them were always women of wealthy families for obvious reasons. To be real honest, most of the scientists of this era were from males were from wealthy families. The Royal Society even excluded, that means the Royal Society, the Royal Society is what we now call the National Geographic Society. It was originated in London as the Royal Society. It was a learning <coughs> society. And the Royal Society excluded Margaret Cavendish, who was a rather well-educated woman, although she, wa she was allowed to attend a meeting. Um, uh, those guys are just, you know, men are awesome, don't you think? Um, Lady Cavendish did write observations upon experimental philosophy and grounds of natural philosophy. And then I say it's a bestseller, and then I say not, because it was not, obviously. I mean, a woman that wrote a book back then, and I'm sure it was the best book around. But I'm telling you, when they say, oh, a woman wrote this, in the fire. It is worth mentioning, however, during the years 1650 to 1710, one out of seven German astronomers were women. And once again, that's probably due to the fact that most people looked at astronomers as nutcases. And so if a woman's doing it, well, she's a, she was a nutcase to begin with. So you want to see the point here? Uh, in other words, astronomy was looked upon as somewhat connected to uh, astrology. Maria Mirian, who was a Dutch woman who studied entomology, insects, traveled to Dutch Suriname to categorize and study insects before she wrote the book Meta Metamorphosis of the Insects of Suriname, which actually was, was read because there wasn't that many people going to Suriname and studying insects. And so, yeah, people looked at it. Maria Winkelmann, a self-taught astronomer, was denied a position uh, as a system astronomer at the Berlin Academy because she was a woman with no universal university degree. Quarles de Femmes, love the French, don't you? Quarles de Femmes um, 
were arguments over whether or not women were equal. What did Vesalius and others who followed discern about the fitness of women for academics? Well, like I said, they tailored their research to show that women were inferior. They had small, smaller skulls. They had uh, their overall bone structure was smaller <coughs> than men. Therefore, they are inferior. And if you really want to get graphic about it, they also tied the weakness of women, not only the childbirth, but to uh, monthly menstruation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Midwifery, um, the science... Science basically described midwifery as the highest uh, skilled job that a woman could aspire to. Why? Because no male wanted to go in there and help a woman with childbirth. Trust me. And so, uh, uh, yeah, you women, uh, we're going to go out here outside about 10 miles away while this is going on. and uh, But you guys... You got it. You got this. Okay. We're going outside. See you in a couple of days. Okay. Overall, the scientific revolution reaffirmed traditional biases and subservient roles of women. Oh, I love this quote. An educated woman is like a gun one shows to a collector. Rare, but has no use at all. Okay. Rene Descartes, father of modern rationalism. Came up with the idea of cognito ergo sum. You say, what does that mean? Cognito ergo sum, it means I think, therefore I am. You say, what does that mean? Well, it is basically the philosophy of the Enlightenment. <laughs> um, you see, the Enlightenment is centered around the idea that you should um, doubt everything. You know, question everything. Nothing is true. Nothing is real. You should doubt everything. Uh, but if you doubt everything, then what can you ever learn? And Rene Descartes thought on that for a long time. And he eventually came to the conclusion that if I am thinking, then I must exist. And from that, cognito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Uh, he then begins to build an entire philosophy about observation, about learning, and those kind of things. So the thinkers of this period championed something called the scientific method. We do recall our good friend Francis Bacon, who fathered this idea, the father of empiricism, that you should learn everything by testing it. You observe something, you make a assumption about it, a thesis about it, then you test the thesis, and from that process you learn, although I've oversimplified it, right, Mr. Lynn, so get off me. Um, uh, so yeah, you test it. Now Francis Bacon died by, uh, and you know, many, well, here's what's ironic, Francis Bacon, many people think that Francis Bacon actually was the writer uh, who wrote all the stuff for William Shakespeare. Uh, and I'm a little off subject here, but, you know, William Shakespeare was this son of a glove maker from Stratford-on-Avon. And even today, Stratford-on-Avon is a tiny little town. And so William Shakespeare is from there. <coughs> and he writes about, you know, um, Moors in North Africa, history with Julius Caesar. He writes about the Danish prince, Hamlet, and all of these things with such knowledge. How could this guy know about it? And a lot of people thought that Francis Bacon actually wrote it, but didn't want the, uh, for some reason, didn't want the acclaim. And so, yeah, Bacon, though, was always researching, always doing experiments. And, yeah, uh, he was trying to figure out if, freezing meat could preserve it longer and so during a snowstorm snowfall he took a bunch of chicken carcasses and stuffed them with snow 
caught in pneumonia. All right. So because of the printing press, though, science and scientific reasoning, scientific society, scientific knowledge began to mushroom. The French society, which was kind of like the English society, uh, the Royal Society in England, basically precursor of the National Geographic, uh, collected tools and machines that were new inventions. Uh, it quickly became an agent of the French king because the French king thought that, you know, we could use this someday. The British society began to investigate technological improvements for industry. These societies also produced scientific journals for the reading public, like what eventually becomes National Geographic, which is National Geographic is one of the few magazines I would subscribe to today. I like the pictures. They have lots of pictures. I like pictures. Uh, <coughs> and a, yeah. um, which was composed mainly of other scientists. Science began to be valued because certain interests, the textile industry in Great Britain, for example, saw a possibility of profiteering for the new knowledge. In other words, uh, there were people who saw the potential for profit from scientific knowledge. And therefore they said, maybe this is something we should look into. Political groups uh, sought scientific backing for their agendas. The agendas. Uh, they, were, they were divided into three groups, levelers, diggers, and ranters. Um, these are people who were against scientific knowledge. Uh, for scientific knowledge, uh, you know. Uh, anyway, the age of science brought about a renewal of the debate between science and religion. Benedict de Spinoza was excommunicated, an excommunicated Amsterdam Jew who rejected Descartes' ideas about the nature of man and God. He wrote the book Ethics, which was a book that said, God is nature. Blaise Pascal was an accomplished French scientist, mathematician, who sought to keep God and science together. He invented a calculating device, a calculating machine. Uh, he also wrote Pensees, where his notes uh, for a book, well, that was to be an apology for the Christian religion. In Pensees, he tried to appeal to the rationalists in both their reason and their emotions. He said, God is a reasonable bet. If he exists and you believe in him, you want all. If he don't exist, eh, you, you, know, you had to be doing something. Pascal, in the end, relied more on faith. He said, reason can only take one so far. Pascal and others, however, failed to reconcile faith and science as Europe continued to become more and more secular. Okay. Now, if you notice, I combined two chapters in here. Now we're on to the age of enlightenment. You see, the age of science. And if you remember, if you look at Tom Ritchie's video yesterday, where he talks about the age of science versus the age of enlightenment, science was a precursor. You know, they're just discovering knowledge in the age of science for knowledge's own sake. Okay. I mean, these are important things. I mean, this kind of thing, I, I can just see this being you know, the type of thing they would bring up on the DBQ. The age of science was a precursor. The age of science was about finding knowledge for its own sake, just observing knowledges, uh, you know, different kinds, gathering knowledge for its own sake. But the age of enlightenment, these guys wanted to change the world. These guys wanted to take logical thinking, reasonable thinking, and change all of society. Okay? Yeah. <clears throat> Roman number one. During the 18th century, the idea that economic change and political reform were both possible and desirable began to spread and become popular. Take a minute and swallow that. That economic change, meaning economic change meant the rich are not the only people who should have a good life. That's what it means. And political reform. All of Europe throughout the Enlightenment <coughs> still lived under the system of three estates, where 97% of the population were peasants and serfs, and 80% in France were peasants who lived in abject, grinding poverty. Anyway, <clears throat> 
This. <coughs> I'm so sorry. I don't know. I'm by myself and I'll wash my hands 20 times a day, so get off me. But it is a reason why we have to be separated. Uh, anyway, this, and it's also the reason why on May 11th, we all got to wear a mask. Yeah. This combined confidence in the human mind and human enterprise inspired with scientific revolution and faith in the power of rational criticism to challenge the intellectual authority and tradition of the Christian past. In other words, you say, what does that mean? Well, up until the age of science, the age of reason, the enlightenment, the single authority for all knowledge for everything was what the church said. This new idea, the source of knowledge and authority, is this guy. Not me, particularly, Mr. Land, although I'm sure you think that's true. Uh, <clears throat> but mankind, what man could learn on his own through logic. <clears throat> they felt that human beings could comprehend the operation of physical nature and mold it to the ends of material and moral improvement, economic growth, and political reform. Basically, they thought that they could, through reasoning, through logic, through what they could learn, make the world a better place. Huh? See? Right. The writers and critics who forged the new attitudes favorable to change, who championed reform, and who flourished in the engaged in, in emerging print culture were called philosophers. Basically, in other words, these guys were called the philosophers. <coughs> I heard philosophes, I think Tom, Uncle Tom called them yesterday. Whatever. <coughs> Philosophy, whatever. Um, philosophes. I, I'm comfortable with that word. So in other words, this is what they're called. These guys who thought this way were called philosophes. Let's call them philosophes or smart guys. Learned guys. Research guys. They sought to apply the rules of reason and common sense to nearly all the major institutions and social practices of the day. And that was their mistake, but that's okay. You know, they tried to apply logic reason to everything. It doesn't fit. That's another story, but yeah. <coughs> Most famous, Voltaire, Montesquieu, Denis Diderot, D'Alembert, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Gordon Hume, Sir Edward Gibbon, um, Smith Lessing, and Immanuel Kant. Yeah, all those guys. These people could be found in the following places. Only a few could be found in universities, unlike today, whereas most major universities have research wings, and they pay people like Dr. Sheldon Cooper and Leonard Hofstetler to do research. Back then, those things didn't exist. You could find a few in the universities occupying teaching positions, and in their spare time, they would write and research. But the great majority of them could be found in salons. S-A-L-O-N-S. What are salons? Drinking establishments, you know, where they served coffee and those kind of things. Uh, <coughs> yeah. Uh, mostly alcohol. And you know what? They were equal opportunity employers in these salons. That's right. They allowed women in these salons. They got to serve coffee. Talking, no. <coughs> yes. Drinking, serving alcohol, yes. All right. Um, in Eastern Europe, they might be found in the royal bureaucracies. They, the philosophers, were not an organized group. The only thing they had in common was that they read a lot and they thought society should be changed. And the philosophers did not agree on many issues. Okay? So don't get that idea. They all you know. Their chief bond was the desire to reform society, thought, and government for the sake of human liberty. You know, that was the thing they did agree on, that they could make, using science, using logic, using reason, they could make society better. Freedom from arbitrary power, freedom of speech, freedom of trade, freedom to realize one's talents, freedom of aesthetic response, 
Freedom in a word, his word to you. Freedom of moral man to make his way in the world. Now, here's what's important. No other single set of ideas than the Enlightenment has done so much to shape the modern world. I mean, where would we be without the Enlightenment? And a lot of these guys were Cretans. A lot of these guys were creepers. But they're thinking that, you know, the world can be explained and the world can be improved using knowledge, using science. That was a world changer. That was a game changer. Uh, but like I said, individually, you would not want to have these guys over for dinner, especially not Jean-Jacques Rousseau. We'll talk about him later. So much of what the philosophers uh, understood as freedom, challenge, established thought of religion. I mean, uh, yeah, sure. Much of what these philosophers thought it was freedom, challenge. I mean, because here's the thing. The philosophers, this was during the neoclassical period of art. Neoclassical, new Greece and Rome. The philosophers uh, idolized not the Judeo-Christian um, morality of the past. They idolized the Greeks and the Romans. The Greeks and Romans were hedonistic. We talked about hedonism and hedonism. Uh, it means basically, if it feels good, do it. And Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who we'll talk about later, he was into this. Yeah. Open morality or lack of conventional morality. All right. So the philosophers embraced many of the changes in agriculture and industry. They were intellectuals, but they were also deeply in touch with everyday life and intellectuals read by people who wished to transform everyday life. They, the philosophers, did use the print culture to spread their ideas. They employed the printed word to declare a new faith in the capacity of humankind to improve itself without the aid of God. Much of the readership of the philosophers, people who read the Enlightenment Encyclopedia, a lot of the knowledge of the philosophers ended up in the Enlightenment Encyclopedia, a compilation, you know what an encyclopedia, a compilation of all the knowledge, and it's placed in a series of books edited by a guy named Denis Diderot. <coughs> <coughs> Much of the readership of the philosophers were people who had money and wherewithal to buy and read their works. Because you gotta remember that during this time, the great majority of the population of Europe was still illiterate. They worked to expose contemporary and social and political abuses and argued that reform was both necessary and possible. In the second half of the 18th century, they became more and more specific and began arguing with each other and became more concerned with politics than religion. The philosophers were certain that human society could be reformed, but were uncertain as to whether or not that improvement was certain or even permanent. This is going to be the last thing we say today, so let's go over that. That's very important. The philosophers were certain that society could be reformed, but they were uncertain as to whether or not that improvement was would actually happen, or if it did happen, would that improvement be permanent? And yeah, they may have hit upon something here. A lot of things about society. Uh, improved as a result of science and reasoning, but uh, in some ways, if you look at the 20th century, mankind retreated backwards. We are going to end there, and we'll begin with Roman numeral three tomorrow, um, and uh, we have a lot to cover. Tomorrow, I'm going to be short because you've got that uh, DBQ. Uh, if you noticed in your uh, canvas, I also put in the Tom Ritchie rubric for the DBQ, have that handy. You know, the cool thing about uh, taking this DBQ at home is that you can have things like that already printed out, a DBQ that, you know, you want to hit all the points with. You can print that out already days in advance <coughs> to help uh, <coughs> guide you. I mean, in reality, you can have open notes. Yeah, you can have open notes. Problem is, 45 minutes. And I'm going to go. Uh, you guys are awesome.
stay safe, uh, stay out of the rain, and it's going to thunderstorm this afternoon, so be careful. I will see you tomorrow. Da 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 da